The ancient world hasn't been forgotten. It's all around us in museums, but it's also buried beneath our feet. In some cases, pieces of it are hiding in plain sight. To prove it, we've put some of the most incredible ancient artifacts together for you in this video. Archaeologists from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History have discovered the remnants of a 400-year-old wooden ship in the city of Chaco de Diez Cavarubias. The rescue excavation unearthed seven timber pieces, each measuring 3 feet in length and 10 inches in width. These timbers date back to the early period of Viceroyalty of New Spain, following the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521. The excavation site was once part of Lake Chalco, one of the great lakes named after the ancient city of Chalco, which was home to Mesoamerican cultures like the Toltecs and Aztecs. The curvature of the timbers suggests they might be from a brigantine-type vessel used by the Spanish conquerors or possibly used to secure indigenous Alcalco canoes on the lake shore. Historical records indicate that the Spanish built a navy of shallow-hulled brigantine-type vessels to seize the Great Lakes in 1521 using salvaged wood from ships that Cortes had ordered to be destroyed upon his arrival at Veracruz in April 1519. The Ina team also discovered a settlement on the northeastern shore of Lake Chalco near the ancient ruins of the ancient Tlatioco city of Tlapacoya. Next, we go to India where archaeologists from the National Institute of Anthropology and History have discovered a 2,000-year-old sculpture of the sun god in farmland in Kalagodu village. Gumagata Mandal of Anantapur district, Andhra Pradesh. The sculpture was found by farmer Harijan Vanarapa's son, Nagendra, while he was tilling the land. The two-foot granite stone sculpture depicts the sun god holding two lotus flowers in both hands. The sculpture's style suggests it could be from the period of the Shadavanas or Ikhvaku kings of Andhra. According to Vedvir Ira, author of the reference book Chronology of India, the sculpture was likely hidden underground or underwater many centuries ago, possibly during an attack by invaders. The discovery of the sculpture could lead to more archaeological finds in the area. The iconography of the sun god has been noted to be similar to other sculptures found in the region, this sculpture will be preserved in the Archaeological Museum in Anatapur, and its discovery provides us with a tantalizing glimpse into India's rich cultural heritage and the reverence for the sun god in ancient times. The ancient Roman Vindolanda site in the UK, known for its well-preserved structures and the writing tablets found buried in its soil, also houses a unique artifact, the Vindolanda Calendar Fragment. Across the entire former Roman Empire, only three calendar fragments have been discovered, one each in Salzburg and Grand France, and the third at Vendolanda. The Vendolanda fragment, made of a copper alloy, is part of a ring estimated to have been one foot in diameter, suggesting it was intended for private use. The fragment has 15 holes, likely used to mark the days with a peg. If the holes were evenly spaced around the entire calendar, each would represent a span of two days. The fragment is inscribed with the word September and letters representing specific dates and the autumnal equinox. Found in 2008 near the Principia and the Granary, the fragment dates to the 3rd or 4th century CE. It's believed the calendar was used to predict future dates related to agricultural and pastoral cycles. However, due to its uniqueness and lack of literary references, its exact purpose remains uncertain. An Anglo-Saxon cemetery in the Lincolnshire Wolds, UK, has revealed the burials of richly dressed women interred with their jewelry and personal items. The cemetery, discovered after a metal detector has found artifacts at the site in Scramby, near Skegness, contains about 20 graves dating back to the 5th and 6th centuries. One of the most striking burials is that of a woman cradling a baby. The women were buried with necklaces made from amber, glass, and rock crystal beads. Personal items such as tweezers, fabric bags, held open by elephant ivory rings, and beautifully decorated brooches. Some even received silver finger rings and a style of silver buckle commonly associated with Jewish communities in Kent. Men, on the other hand, were buried with weaponry such as spears and shields. 
The lavish burials are in line with the funerary rites adopted during the early centuries of the Germanic migrations to eastern England. This, the first known excavation at the site, involved members of the RAF, international volunteers, and students. The teeth and bones of those buried are being analyzed to identify their origins and diet, while the ivory rings are being examined to determine the elephant species used to produce them. The Mastaba of Hesire, an ancient Egyptian tomb complex located in Saqqara, Egypt, is home to a unique collection of wooden panels. These panels, discovered in 1860 by August Marriott, are renowned for their exquisite craftsmanship and historical significance. The Mastaba, dating back to the 3rd century around 2700 BCE, was the final resting place of the Hesire, a high official under King Djoser. The panels, carved from imported Lebanese cedar, depict Hesire in various postures and outfits, seemingly narrating key moments of his life. The panels were embedded in false doors, possibly representing the deceased in the afterlife. The precision and artistry of the panels are remarkable, with Hesire's features and the hieroglyphics above his head carved with an extraordinary sureness of hand. The panels were exhibited at the Universal Exhibition of 1878 in Paris, where they were recognized as the oldest pieces illustrating pharaonic antiquities. In 2021, the Egyptian Museum launched a restoration project for the panels in cooperation with the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology, aiming to study their reinstallation in a context that recalls their original presentation in the Mastaba. Winter counts, or Waniyetu Wawapi in Lakota, are pictorial calendars or histories used by Native American tribes in North America, including the Blackfeet, Mandan, Kiowa, Lakota, and other Plains tribes. These calendars, traditionally painted on bison hides, depict the most significant events of each year, serving as mnemonic records for oral histories. The term winter count comes from the Lakota language with Wainayetu translating to winter and Wawapi referring to anything that's marked and can be read or counted. The tradition of creating winter counts dates back to the pre-contact period and was a crucial part of indigenous lifeways, helping to transmit knowledge from generation to generation. The winter counts often reveal communal histories, interband relations, and interactions with European settlers. Today, these winter counts serve as valuable historical sources for understanding the history of the Great Plains peoples and their experiences with colonialism. The Smithsonian scholar Garrick Mallory used one of these events, the year the stars fell, to correlate the Lakota winter counts with Western calendars and analyze the history of the people. They're a remarkable way of preserving history from a culture that had no written language. A 1,500-year-old limestone altar discovered in the La Corona archaeological site in northern Guatemala has unveiled intriguing insights into the political strategies of the ancient Mayan Conal dynasty. The altar, found in a temple, depicts King Choctuk Ichak, ruler of La Corona, holding a scepter from which two patron gods of the city emerge. The inscription on the 4.7-foot by 3-foot slab corresponds to May 12, 544. The altar reveals that the Connell dynasty, also known as the Serpent Kingdom, orchestrated a political movement in La Corona that led to their victory over their rivals in Tico in 562, enabling them to rule the Mayan lowlands in southeastern Mesoamerica for two centuries. The political strategy involved forming alliances with smaller cities surrounding Tico. The altar also provides detail of a royal wedding between a princess from the Serpent Kingdom and a king of La Corona. The discovery of the altar has been likened to a historical Mayan version of Game of Thrones, shedding light on the political maneuverings of the time. Other than the dragons, perhaps the events of Game of Thrones weren't as fantastical as we all thought they were. Archaeologists have made a remarkable discovery at the Castle of Ain in Spain's Castellan region, a medieval sword in excellent condition dating back to the 14th century. The sword measuring three feet long, with a five-inch guard and a spherical pommel, was found under a mortar floor in a room equipped with a hearth and a workbench. The discovery was made during a project aimed at reinforcing the castle's southwest wall to halt its deterioration and enhance its historical significance. 
The Castle of Ain, nestled in the Sierra del Aspidin foothills, was constructed in the 13th century by the Moorish rulers of the Taifa of Valencia. However, it was soon conquered by James I of Aragon in 1238. The region witnessed numerous revolts and reconquests, and the castle suffered significant damage during the War of the Two Peters between 1356 and 1375. After the final defeat of Muslim forces in the 1500s, the castle lost its strategic importance and fell into ruin. Today, the Catalan government and the Ain City Council are funding excavations and structural reinforcements to preserve what remains of this historical site. The Porhalan is the traditional calendar of the Badak people of North Sumatra, Indonesia. This lunisolar calendar, derived from the Hindu calendar, consists of 12 months of 30 days each, with an occasional leap month. The Badak people primarily use the Porhalan to determine auspicious days, with the interpretation of the calendar falling to the chief male ritualist known as the Datu. The Porhalan is usually written as a table of square boxes on a cylindrical piece of bamboo or recorded in the Pushtaha, the Badak magic book. The calendar system does not designate years, with the new year beginning on the new moon in May. Each month is named by its number, and each day of the week is named after a celestial body borrowed from the Sanskrit names. The Porhalan is a clear example of the Badakization of Hindu culture, with the original Hindu calendar being modified and simplified according to Badak empirical and pragmatic principles resulting in a divination calendar not used for telling time. It's yet another reminder that there were plenty of different ways of dividing time before the advent of the Gregorian calendar. In fact, there still are. The octopus frontlet, a stunning artifact from the Moche culture of ancient Peru, is a testament to the intricate craftsmanship and rich symbolism of this civilization. This headdress, dating from 300 to 600 CE, was crafted from gold, chrysocala, and shells, and features a central face with oversized fangs and frontal eyes, surrounded by eight serrated appendages ending in animal faces. These appendages, identified as octopus tentacles, are believed to add symbolic power to the artifact. The Moche culture, known for its expressive figural imagery, often depicted complex narratives in their art, reflecting their understanding of the cosmos and their relationship with the natural world. The octopus frontlet is believed to represent a complex moche deity, I Apeyak, a protective figure who would assist the moche in times of chaos and disorder. The octopus tentacles may symbolize the rays of the sun, while the central face is thought to be an adaptation of an ancient Andean deity known as the Staff God. This artifact, recovered from a burial site in the Jecatepec Valley, is considered one of the finest examples of Moche metalwork, reflecting the civilization's advanced metallurgical techniques and unique artistic style. The Dahe Ding, an ancient Chinese bronze rectangular Ding vessel from the late Shang Dynasty circa 1600 to 1046 BCE, is a unique artifact discovered in Tanheli Nixiang, Hunan, in 1959. Now housed in the Hunan Museum, it's the only known ancient bronze cauldron decorated with high-relief human faces on each of its four sides. The vessel, named after the inscription Dahi, or Great Grain, found on its interior wall, is believed to have been used during harvest sacrifices. Despite being discovered in the southern Yangtze region, the inscription closely resembles those found in the Kor Zhongyuan region of the Shang Dynasty. The vessel is rectangular with four legs measuring 15 inches high with an opening slightly larger than its bottom. The human faces on the vessel are surrounded by small symbolic decorations of horns and claws suggesting a half-human, half-animal nature. These figures are speculated to represent ancient mythological figures, Nuo masks, or local ancestral deities. The Da He Ding was accidentally discovered by a peasant and was initially sold as scrap metal before being rescued and restored by the Hunan Museum. We know that our ancient ancestors loved playing board games. Many of the board games we play today are based on games that were invented hundreds or even thousands of years ago. 
Some of the games our ancestors came up with, though, are total mysteries to us because they didn't think to leave the instructions behind for us to find. Take, for example, the board game that was found inside the tomb of a Germanic prince in Poprad, Slovakia in 2006. The board is damaged but fairly well preserved, but that hasn't helped historians to identify it. As best as they can tell, this ancient board game has no parallel anywhere else in the world. It's roughly 1,600 years old and is divided into squares like a chessboard. Green and white playing pieces were found with the board, but finding the pieces doesn't tell us how to use them. This isn't uncommon. We don't really know how to play the ancient Viking board game of Hnefafadl, despite several modern-day board game experts attempting to reconstruct the rules. And we're not sure about the ancient Roman board game Ludus Latrin Calorum either. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.